Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ross, uh, red t shirt here. I'm going to mute everybody's microphones uh, just so I can control the sound levels for the recording. Um, if I can ask co host to just unmute yourself as and when you're ready. Um, so welcome to our webinar. Um, we're going to get into straight into business. Uh, I'm going to let um, each of the uh, people from Valencia Institute um, to introduce themselves shortly. We're going to be uh, approximately an hour. Um, all the slides, any resources, and uh, this video itself, uh, once I compress it, I'll send it over to you in about an hour or so's time. Um, so just quick introductions. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you've come to, obviously through my uh, Teacher Talk uh, Eventbrite page. Um, I've been a teacher in London for 25 years and blogging online for uh, a good 12 years and got quite a little bit of an audience. Um, I'm going to bring in the slides in a moment, um, but before I do, just to kind of introduce you to um, Valencia Institute and obviously the uh, Dr. Robert Liu will go into uh, more specific details, but um, I'm really honoured to introduce um, Valencia to the UK um, and, uh, for the first time. Um, they're a, an online platform and they're here to share their expertise with you um, in a climate where come September, um, whether we, uh, at least for people watching in the UK, um, will be back to normal service or having to uh, offer online. And my own experience of working in schools across the UK, visiting many uh, online and virtual schools, these things have already been around for many years. Um, so it's nothing new to these um, experts. So I'm gonna be sharing their insights, asking lots of questions. I'm gonna try and facilitate the whole session and keep everyone uh, up to speed. Um, so, um, that's me. I'm going to ask um, the um, uh, uh, people taking part, so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Robert Liu, first of all, just to come in and introduce yourself, Robert, to our guests, and I'll just get the slides up um, once we've done our introductions. Um, so, over to you, Robert. Fantastic, Ross. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us, and also thanks to all of you for tuning in. Um, so, my name's Rob Liu. I'm at Harvard University, and I've been sort of a biologist and a professor there for 30 years. But for 20 of those years, I've also been very engaged with high schools. And so for me, one of the great exciting adventures that I'm doing now is that I'm also the chancellor of, of the Valencia Institute. So I really look forward to sharing with you what we have been doing in Valencia as a private online high school. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, Amy, can I ask yourself um, to unmute and introduce yourself to everybody? Um, so Amy's the Chief Academic Officer of the, the Valencia Institute. Amy? Thank you, Ross, and hello, everyone. It's lovely to see you. Uh, as Ross alluded to, I'm the Chief Academic Officer at Valencia Institute, um, and I have the privilege of, of working with Rob Liu um, to, uh, to offer our, our online courses to students around the world. Um, previous to uh, Valencia, I was the uh, Chief of Education at Get Smarter, and we partnered with tertiary institutions to help them take their courses online. So it's a pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and Nesh, can I ask, ask you to unmute yourself and uh, introduce everybody uh, uh, yourself to everybody? Thank you. Well, thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, well, hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing well today. Thank you for, for having and hosting us. Uh, my name is Nish. I'm head of admissions at Valencia. I've been in an admissions role for a number of years. Uh, as you can imagine, with admissions, we get to engage with a lot of parents and students along the way, uh, definitely trying to, to help and guide them, make the right decisions. So I look forward to engaging with everybody in the chat. If you do have any questions, please feel free to pop them in there, um, and I'll, I'll try my best to get through all of them. Thanks. Thanks, Nash. And, and over to our, our head teacher, at Rick. Rick, could you unmute yourself and just say hello to everybody, please? Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Rick Greener. Thank you, Ross, for hosting this. Um, good to see everybody here. Um, I'm, as uh, Ross says, the principal at Valencia and um, the director of teaching and learning there. Uh, I've been prior oh. to this and uh, been involved in uh, a lot of uh, technology development at that school as well and uh, really um, in embracing and enjoying this uh, online environment at the moment. Thanks, Russ. Okay, thank you very much, Rick. And to, uh, finally to Sarah, please. Sarah, could you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be talking to you today about online education. My name is Sarah Elphick, and I'm the senior English teacher at Valencia Institute, teaching junior high and IGCSE. 
um, and my background is predominantly speak, uh, teaching IGCSE, AS and A-levels English in international schools in Cape Town. Okay, fantastic. So um, that's everybody. Um, behind the scenes, one or two other people just helping with admin in the chat box. So uh, any questions in the chat box? I'm going to share my screen. Um, you're going to see uh, the Valencia slides and I'm going to go straight to Rob. Um, and Rob, could you let viewers know a little bit more about Valencia Institute and how you work and how it differs to traditional um, bricks and mortar? You need to unmute yourself, Rob. Thank you. Um, with Valencia, we really had an opportunity to build a private online school from the ground up. So we're sort of at a stage right now where we have a number of subjects in, in terms of the um, junior high. We've started junior high. We also have a number of subjects in the international GCSE. By next um, fall, we should have um, A-levels and our number of, of sort of subjects will expand. And actually you can see in the next slide and actually the next slide after that. Ross, if you could forward it. Yes. So that's sort of what we have right now, but we're really in the process of sort of expanding this out. But what's exciting about what we're doing at Valencia is that we've tried to implement a learning model that allows not only foundational subject coverage to happen in a way, as we'll see in a few minutes, we believe really enhances and promotes deep learning, but we've tried to do it in a way that allows the students to really feel that they're in the driver's seat. So if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is that we have created a framework for Valencia that's focused on sustainability, and in particular, using the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs of the United Nations. Now, for those of you that might not have heard of the SDGs before, this is the only framework for meeting the world's challenges that actually exists out there. Absolutely the only one that's been um, ratified internationally. And so what we have done, there's 17 of them, we have taken that framework and identified four major thematic areas that all of us as human beings need to worry about. Climate and energy, gender and justice, health and food, and jobs and industry. And one of the critical things we're doing at Valencia is that not only are you learning the subjects that you need to in junior high and in high school, but you're doing it in a context where you can apply what you have learned so that you can actually creatively um, innovate and think about ways to meet these challenges in this framework. So there is this principle of what's called challenge-driven learning, which there are many studies that now show that that is one of the most powerful ways to engage students and to also create a curriculum that's vibrant and alive. And so Valencia is very much structured around that principle. So Robert, when you um, describe online learning, it's quite different from the emergency that we're currently in during the pandemic, which is remote learning, um, which currently teachers are doing. Um, can you just clarify how you describe the, di the difference or the distinction between remote versus um, online? Absolutely. So, um, and, and by the way, as someone that um, teaches and taught this spring, I certainly went through this. So one definition that I use for remote learning is that essentially that is when you have a brick and mortar class that halfway through you need to do the pivot to teaching all of your students scattered all over the place um, and remotely. What that means is that you're really focused on doing your best to transfer what you would have been doing in the brick and mortar classroom into an online setting. When we think about online learning, what we think about are things that are built from the bottom up to work really effectively online. And at Valencia, we use a process called ADDI. And in fact, if we jump one slide forward, what ADDI stands for is in fact a way in which you approach, approach the building of your course. So you begin with analysis, right? What are the objectives for your course or even for a single session that you want to achieve? You then design all the components what your students will do, what they'll be listening to, what they'll be le actually reading, then you develop those components, you thread them together into a learning pathway, and then as this is executed with your students, you evaluate how you're doing and you line that up with your original objectives. So this is actually the gold standard for how you build a program, a whole curriculum, but also how you build an individual course. So that everything we do is focused on this really cycle 
of where we analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And what this allows us to do is that you don't just build a course once. You need to actually constantly evaluate it and evolve your course to really make it as strong as possible. So Ross, if you move forward, yes. And so one of the critical outcomes of this is this principle of a learning pathway. You know, very often we think about a syllabus, what are the subjects we have to cover? We think about a lecture, what are the topics we're gonna cover? What ADI allows you to do is create a learning design plan that is actually translated into what we call learning pathways. If you look at your course, if you look at every individual session and think about what is the path your student is taking, mm -hmm. right? How do they deal with the content? And how do you actually think about a pathway where you combine you know, journaling, where they're having reflection, where you have a live session with them, what activities are, are they doing to enrich their understanding of the subject, and what is the graded material that they can then use to understand if they've learned the material. This process of a pathway with built-in feedback loops where they're allowed to retrieve their learning is absolutely critical. So this is really what online learning looks like today. Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm gonna bring in um, Sarah. Um, Sarah, for a teacher who's thinking more about interactive uh, kind of participatory live on learn, online learning in the future, and perhaps the term ahead, uh, given the way things are currently looking for the start of the new school year, what practical suggestions like lesson length or design tips do you recommend to enhance engagement in live sessions and throughout the school day and week? So, in a brick and mortar school, you have so many opportunities for spontaneous student interaction. And online, unfortunately, it's, it's quite limited and quite planned and quite structured. So planning in an online environment becomes uh, critical to the success of what you are doing. And to ensure that our live sessions are as focused as they can be and that we take full advantage of our face-to-face -face time with our students, we use what is called the flipped classroom methodology. Mm -hmm. So if you just go to the next slide, so you can have a look. Yeah, there we go. So this methodology relies on a learner's prior exposure to the content before they reach the classroom space. So as Rob spoke about, a lot of detail and planning goes into the design of every one of our subjects' learning paths. And so as a result at Valencia, the flipped classroom approach is not as simple as or limit to, limited to giving your students an information pack at the beginning of the week and then sending them off to, to learn. Um, there's a lot more that goes, goes into it. So uh, on the screen here, we have a screenshot. We just want to go back again. All right. That's okay. Um, we have a screenshot of a learning path from my junior high English module on social media. And I've highlighted exactly where my live sessions are in that module so that you can see what happens before the learners even get to me. And so what we see here is that by the time, is, by the, time the learners are in front of me, they've already read a short set of notes, so they're only 10 minutes long, and they've completed something called an answer garden, which I'll show you in a moment, and that's also only 10 minutes. And you'll also see that each live session that I have with my learners is it's never longer than 45 minutes. Um, in online learning, you really want to avoid the double lessons that we usually do in a brick and mortar school. Uh, it's very difficult to keep your students interact and um, focus for that amount of time. So we make sure that it's always 45 minutes. Um, if you go on to the next slide, I can show you what this looks like. Okay, so here is a screenshot of our first no um, set of notes. Um, and it's a it's very introductory. Um, and we also estimate that it takes about three minutes per page for a, a student to get through the notes. So on average, our notes are very rarely longer than three pages. And in the second screenshot, that is an example of an answer garden. And you can see here that the learners had an opportunity to tap into their prior knowledge and show what they already know about or feel towards social media um, in preparation for my lesson with them. And then in the next slide, we have a screenshot there we go, um, of what was taking place in one of my lessons. So because the learners had completed these two very short, very simple tasks before they saw me, they were already oriented towards the subject, um, which meant that I could use my live session time to extend their existing knowledge. 
Um, and then this particular screenshot is from one of those social media lessons. And as you can see, the learners were able to test their understanding in the lesson. Um, and in this instance, they were using the annotate tool to complete this graphic organizer. And I was in a position where I was able to facilitate and deepen that understanding. So in using the flipped classroom approach in a very considered and very conscious way, the live sessions themselves have the potential to be highly interactive and participatory. And then further down in the learning path, if you want to skip ahead to the next slide, please. Thanks, Ross. Um, okay, so you can see here, I've got a little arrow pointing out to a discussion forum. So this is another example of where um, the learners can interact away from the teacher, but they are still progressing in their learning. So here you can see that I haven't only thought about the instructions that I want my learners to follow in the discussion forum, but I've also thought very carefully about the learning outcomes associated with this particular co component in the learning path. And then on the next slide, we have um, an example of a response from a student. And you can see that because of this backwards design, we have a highly focused and thoughtful um, interaction here. Um, and all our conversations with our learners end up being that way, even if we are not physically in front of them. So what you can hopefully see from this approach is that um, if you are very mindful about what you are doing in the time that you have with your students, it is possible to have a 45 minute lesson and get through all the work. So rather than using your lessons to disseminate information, which uses a lot of time and undercuts the potential for meaningful interactions, um, in instead you should design your learning path so that you can take advantage of face-to-face -face time and facilitate deep learning. So here's a question for you, Sarah. Um, trying to create a sense of community and establish relationships online. Um, how do you manage to achieve that and, and create those kind of connections? Because we, you know, we know that uh, education very much relies on relationships. Um, what tips do you have to create that sense of community? So I think all teachers know that <laughs> maybe the most important thing is the connections that you have with your students. It is vital. And particularly in an online environment, you know, to avoid a kid feeling that they're sitting in front of a screen and they're just being talked at, which becomes a very passive experience. It's almost, um, there's almost more pressure on the, the teacher to be highly interactive, mm -hmm. um, especially because you also don't have those, those spontaneous moments where you walk past a student at school or they come and have lunch in your classroom or anything like that. So again, then, um, live sessions, there's a lot of pressure there to make sure that you are taking that opportunity to foster a sense of community. Um, so if you go to the next slide, sure. um, just a few tips. So what I find very interesting is that technology actually increases our opportunity for inclusion. And so it becomes possible to bring learners into the conversation who are typically more passive. So I give my students in all my lessons the choice to ask or answer questions aloud, or to type them directly to me in the chat box. And then throughout the lesson, I make sure to answer all those questions as they come up. Or if I feel like it's a little bit unrelated to what we're doing, then I just say to the students that I will get to that at the very end of the lesson. Um, and what this has done is it's meant that the learners who are typically more reserved and prefer not to involve themselves overtly in group settings are now in a position to participate without the same sense of risk. So for many of them, they, their sense of confidence has grown because they've started to realize that their questions and answers do have a place in the classroom and that they do add value to the, the discussions that we have. I also encourage my learners to thank each other or acknowledge each other when someone asks a question or offers an answer that helps them. So as you can see in this image, um, someone, one, some student in the class said something that Joylin found to be helpful. So she used this thumbs up reaction, which I mean, Zoom has the thumbs up and the clapping, which happens a lot in my classes now. And the more you encourage your learners to use these kinds of tools, the more of a habit it becomes and the more supported the learners feel when they choose to share their ideas or ask questions during the class. So in that sense, the technology has really fostered that sense of community. Um, it's also really important that as a teacher, you inject as much personality into those 45 minutes as you can, as well as allow the learners to bring their personalities to the, the lesson. So because of this, I make a point in every lesson to include at least one little activity or, or hook 
that allows the learners to bring themselves into the content. And I also mentally factor in the time that it might take for them to share um, a story that's related to that. So in this example here, I was teaching my learners about the narrative arc and I was using a roller coaster as a metaphor. And you can see here, they were annotating on the roller coaster how they would have felt at, at various points. And I mean, some of the stuff there, there's one kid who, who seemed to really think he was gonna die on this particular roller coaster. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And it just sort of, yeah, again, injected some enthusiasm and excitement and brought it back to their own lives. And then you allow the, ki the kids to ask you these random questions about roller coasters. You know, you ensure that that happens in your lessons. Sarah, I'm gonna throw in an extra question here. Um, a lot of people watching in the UK are going to have, you know, general safeguarding fears about ch children's behaviour online. How, 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 what advice would you give for people? So this is a really interesting question. At Valencia, we do have a code of conduct that the, the learners must abide by. And we have, dis you know, this disciplinary action that follows on from that. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, we've been very fortunate that we haven't had those kinds of issues in our lessons. Um, our kids know where the line is drawn and but you've um, got all the kind of safety rules and regulations all mapped out so it's clear from the start so in fact if you actually go to the next slide i haven't got an example of it but you'll see that i have yeah there we go if it loads there we are so you can see there i've got a screenshot of the different discussion forums that i have and at the top there it says forum etiquette and guidelines so we make it very clear to the students all the time what is expected of them in terms of how they behave in the online space. Um, but to just sort of finish up talking about, you know, this idea of fostering a sense of community outside of our face-to-face -face interactions with our students, I create discussion forums that are outside the learning path. So in other words, there, there are no learning outcomes associated with them. And one of the discussion forums that I created is to allow my students to share their creations with the rest of their cohort. And it can be anything, so art, music, writing, anything that they want it to be. And as you can see in the one where I've highlighted that creativity one, I've already had 136 posts from my learners there. So they've really, really lent into it a lot more than I anticipated. Um, last week, I had a student post a video of himself doing a happy, happy Friday dance. And another learner wrote a rap and posted a video of herself performing it. So this particular forum has been an incredibly supportive and celebratory space where our learners actively encourage and demonstrate appreciation for one another. So hopefully what you can see here is that, I mean, I think we all know that online learning could be very dull and boring. But if you do take advantage of the tools that are available to you in an online space and you lean into them, you don't resist them. Um, there is a lot that you can do to create a very close-knit community. And it's a slow process, but it will happen. Uh, thank you, Sarah. I'm going to ask uh, Amy to come in here on, on, on the topic of, you know, looking at apps and tools. As teachers look to leverage uh, new technology to teach their classes, do you have any apps that you could recommend or go-to points for teachers um, who are looking to integrate more active tools in their online teaching? Sure. Thanks, Russ. So, and maybe I can just comment on one of the questions you asked, Sarah. One of the great things about Zoom is that every lesson is recorded. So, mm -hmm. uh, tying in the code of conduct and the expected behaviors that we expect from our students, they also know that all of their activity on our platform is monitored. So, where we have had the odd instance where a child has behaved inappropriately, uh, they immediately face disciplinary action. So I think knowing the boundaries and understanding mm -hmm. that even though they're operating in an online space, they still are expected to conduct themselves in a specific right. way or they face certain consequences, I think is really important. Right, thank um, you. So maybe just to speak about the apps and tools side of things. So we use a Canvas learning management system and there are quite a few different learning management systems. I'm sure some of you would have had exposure to those, uh, things like Moodle, Blackboard, uh, Google Classroom and I think you know really as you're looking to a learning management system and to choosing one it's really important that you understand what features you're looking for we used a scorecard approach where we try to find um, specific a specific learning management system that that would be fit for purpose and um, so if you go into the next slide you'll see just this is how we've set up our, our canvas instance um, what's great about canvas is that and um, the reason why we actually chose it is because it offered so many integrations with different edu apps. So if you jump to the next slide, mm -hmm. um, you can actually view all of these edu apps on the edu app center. 
Um, and this really just has a whole bunch of apps that integrate with various learning management systems. And I think really when it comes to choosing different apps and, and pieces of technology, you really need to understand what your, what your learning objectives are. Every app comes with its own learning curve. And so if you're kind of choosing a, a bespoke set of apps that you're wanting to integrate, it's really important that you keep going with them because students take a while to actually get accustomed to using them. Um, so if you go into the next slide, mm -hmm. um, I've, I've basically just, I've listed a lot of the different apps that we use at Valencia. Obviously Zoom is fundamental to the teaching live environments, very much like this, it's, it's the classroom really. Um, and we, we use this for all of our live sessions and we, we do a number of teaching live sessions um, that have interaction but are focused very much on you know, getting through the, the, the content and then we've got breakout live sessions where we break our students up into smaller groups and, and um, we do a lot of application work with them there. On the next slide, um, and this is at this point, I'm going to hand over to um, to Rob to take us through Lab Exchange because this is an incredibly exciting addition to uh, Valencia's offering. Um, and so at this point, I'm actually going to stop speaking and I'm just going okay. to hand straight sure, over so to Rob. So I'm going to um, hand over there, Rob, so you should be able to show your screen to everybody. Yes, perfect. Okay, so, um, so Lab Exchange is a platform that's focused on the teaching of science. It launched on January, and in full disclosure, um, this was done by my group at Harvard. And um, what Lab Exchange allows you to do is to teach science really in the context of sort of um, simulations and a whole rich series of kinds of things that you can do. So the way in which we've structured things, they're not structured like a course. They're structured in terms of what we call clusters. So here's one focused on biotechnology. And as you might imagine, because of my role at Valencia as chancellor, Lab Exchange also has this principle of what we call a learning pathway, right? Where once again, there's a series of rich media things that you're able to do. But one of the things that we've created at Valencia, and if you're teaching science, and uh, particular molecular biology, you should look at this, is that we have created an entire structure of virtual labs, right? Where you're able to actually go in and you have a virtual lab environment that your students can use and they can actually run experiments, they get guidance, can take notes, etc. And all of this is free and accessible to all of you. So I would really recommend that you take, um, take a look at that. And it's designed to work very well with any learning management system that you have in that it's like a lightweight overlay that you can use. What's also noteworthy is that you can build classes. So this is a class that I'm teaching right now with 60 students in it. And as one might imagine, the pathway concept continues. So like, for example, this is a pathway that I built for my students earlier this week, where you set the learning objectives and you have a particular sequence of activities, including um, video, readings, and sort of formative assessment and interactives that the students can go through. So this is one example of a free app, uh, of a free platform, frankly, that all of you can use. Rob, so in the, in the, uh, before I bring back to Amy, in, in keeping with cognitive load theory and memory, I'm gonna launch, launch a poll, uh, so it should be on your screen now. Um, and that's asking you a number of questions. So if you could just uh, respond to those and then, I will get the screen, um, the slides back on your screen shortly. So I'll give you another uh, 10 or 15 seconds just to respond to that survey. Let me just come out of that while I do that. Okay, five more seconds. Okay, so um, here, come the results um, so you should be able to see uh, so we just want to get a sense of who's what uh, who's watching so uh, we've got a couple of parents so not a couple um, two percent of parents um, uh, do you feel ready to teach for September the vast majority so 64 um, percent do you already have students learning online so a large number of you do which is good to hear and are you aware of Valencia so some of you are which is reassuring. So uh, now you all are, which is even better. Um, so Amy, over to you just to go through the kind of next set of apps, if that's um, okay with you. Sure. 
Uh, so I think maybe to just pick up what we what we wanted to do is just show you some of the the apps and tools that we integrate with our learning management system. So if you think about these as Lego blocks that you can kind of think about and build them into your course, but you really need to think about the learning objectives, what you're trying to achieve with your students. So uh, we use a lot of the G Suite tools. And um, this is just an example of Google Sites. Um, but G Suite has, you know, they've got Google Documents, Slides, etc. And this is really a great uh, set of tools for collaborative work. Um, specifically, that was one where Sarah, uh, Sarah's kids actually worked on a website project together and they produced the most beautiful websites together. Um, you know, G Suite tools continued. We use forms for social voting. So again, coming back to that point on how do you get engagement prior to a live session or check for consolidation afterwards. Uh, we use uh, Google Forms for social voting. Um, then if you go to the next one, um, IXL for maths and English practice. It's a great bank of um, maths and English practice exercises um, catering for all of the year levels um, in the secondary school space. And, it's, uh, and even below that as well. Duolingo for languages. So uh, specifically for French, we use a lot of the Duolingo lessons and intersperse those with our own, um, with our own language lessons. Um, it's a fantastic app um, that our students really enjoy using. And then H5P for interactive lesson material. This is a great uh, set of tools that really allow you to add interactivity to things like videos and um, the, the answer garden that, sh that Sarah shared earlier. There are a number of different things that you can do with H5P tools to really uh, ensure that you're getting the engagement levels up on your online course. Um, if you jump to the next one, this is an example. So that was just the previous one was an example of um, an H5P tool and this as well is um, also an example. So this is the answer garden example from earlier. Um, all of these are available on H5P. Then um, PHET interactive simulations. These are also a bunch of um, science uh, um, simulations that we use um, from time to time. Um, and then if you go to the next one, um, Prezi is also fantastic. So if you're wanting to look at explaining visually oriented uh, concepts, um, that need a, a grounding in visuals, um, it's, a, it's a great um, tool to use. Time Toast, interactive timelines, allows kids to build interactive timelines, um, which are visualized differently, either on an actual timeline or in a different format, which I think is on the next slide. Um, Sarah actually used this in her course where she wanted to track the evolution of, um, of uh, media and covers, magazine covers over time, um, allowing students to build those out. Um, and then the next one, I'm not sure if there are any more in here. I think there might be one more. No. Okay. So, so that's just like, time that's just like yeah. a, yeah, that's a, that's a, just a snapshot of the different things that you can integrate. I mean, there's so many, and I think it's really just to be creative at the end of the day and yeah. think about how you I imagine to it's been um, normal, normal school for you uh, uh, as, as usual, uh, Amy, but I'm interested in whether you have also had to make adjustments to students' uh, needs during lockdown. Uh, mental health, uh, have you had a spike in numbers? Um, are there any new interventions, for example, that have been uh, especially effective that you could share? Hmm. We definitely have had to make some, some adjustments. Um, we only had one blended class that was affected by lockdown. Otherwise, it's been business as usual and school as usual for, for our kids. Um, but we have learned some lessons along the way. And I think, I mean, one of the things I've said, fail fast, fail forward. So if you go to the next slide, one of the key things, I, I pulled up this because I'm not sure how many of you can relate. Um, just a lot, number of our, of our teachers just coming back and saying, no one shows up to office hours. We have these office hours, we set them up, we want the kids to come. Um, and you know, this concept of teachers just feeling a bit lonely in, in the office hours. Um, and so one of the things we've, we've realized is that, you know, there's, there's some practical things that we really need to do to increase the engagement with those office hours, specifically adding to them to the learning path so that students can actually see them there. Um, but actually, I, Rob, um, I, I would love for you to just speak a little bit to, to the office hours because you made some great points the other day just around how we can actually engage students in office hours and get them to come and show up. Right. So, I mean, I think it's, it's actually something we've learned a lot in brick and mortar as well as online. Um, students and anyone will not show up unless they have a specific reason to do so. So two ways in which I have tried to, to sort of lay this out 
is that I will hold back from my classes some connection with a current affair, a current issue that's very pro really provocative, really controversial, etc. And um, using things taken from movies and series on TV, I'll create a cliffhanger in the class where it's like, well, there's this question that we haven't tackled yet, but if you want to hear about that, come to my office hours. And so that's one way in which you can set up a reason for them to come so that students are often nervous coming to office hours because they feel like, oh, I have to have something really brilliant or I have to have a lot of problems that I need to talk about, in which case I'm nervous about coming anyway. If you give them a reason to come that's interesting and provocative, then I think the other reasons will then follow very easily. So structuring um, opportunities where there's a reason to come that's actually linked with what you're teaching, I think is certainly a powerful way of doing it. Think about cliffhangers in your course. Can I uh, just add a point in about um, workload and also this, in, you know, the engagement tips very useful, Rob. But in, in terms of workload, um, you know, for, uh, there's a large number of people watching from around the world on this session, at least 30 countries, but the vast majority are in the UK. And I know workload blights teachers internationally, not just specifically to the UK, but um, what workload tips do you have for teachers working online through your uh, particular niche? How do you balance your own work-life balance and sustain that with the pupils in which you work? Well, I mean, that is something that I'm, uh, I'm struggling with right now. I think we're now in a situation where every day seems the same and everything seems like a long sort of continuation. What I found for myself is that it's very useful for you to sort of really define a schedule. And it's actually what we tell our students as well. Build a schedule, even though all of our lives are now self-paced. Build a schedule, define clear blocks of time where you're doing your course development, you're working on your lecture, you're doing a recording, you're putting things up into the, into the learning management system, you're having some sort of set of office hours. Mm -hmm. Try to define that upfront as clearly as possible and no matter what, stick with it. Because the risk of having everything creep into every conceivable hour that you have will actually wear you down, right? And this is one way to truly avoid burnout. Thank you. Um, Amy? Yes, and I see some of, the, some of the viewers are asking about what office hours are. So basically, in order to make yourself more available, naturally you don't have a physical classroom. What we do is we create these office hours where students know that they can really just drop in, speak to their teacher, ask them questions about the, the work that they're doing, and, um, and, and check in on key concepts. And what we really want them to do is show up, right? Um, and so this office hours tip on introducing cliffhangers is, is something we've, we've seen is, is working. Um, so, okay, so you can go on to the next slide for me. Um, so yeah, and then including them in the learning path. We've just seen that this concept of a learning path is probably one of the most important things um, in designing effective online courses. And so anything that's not in the learning path kind of gets left behind. Um, and so, you know, this concept of, of you know, uh, students receiving packs of work that they need to work through, there's very little structure in that. And so the learning path almost becomes like the center of, of uh, the central focus in, in helping, helping students get through their work. Thank you, Amy. I'm going to bring in Rick, our head teacher. Um, Rick, um, I want to come back to this point on safeguarding. Uh, you know, I know viewers are watching in the UK are going to be particularly nervous um you know access to remote learning for a lot of our vulnerable pupils about 1.3 million in the uk access to technology the safeguarding risks the costs all those types of things but the safety aspect of online learning rick by which i mean you know external disruptions you know background noises uh, zoom bombing and students taking pictures of themselves but what tools do you use to keep things safe for everyone and what advice can you share to everybody watching uh, Ross, I think that's a, it's always a big concern. You use the word technology and people start to get nervous, particularly when you mix that with education. And I think your structure is tremendously important to start with, to make sure you've thought of all the aspects and you've covered them. And for us, uh, that meant uh, policy. I know it was mentioned earlier. You asked a question to Sarah about that. And so we have a code of conduct for the students that they uh, go through. They, they need to understand. They need to sign. The parents sign it. Um, and we take the discipline very seriously. We have a faculty board 
it meets on a very, very regular basis uh, to deal with any uh, disciplinary matters, be it from misconduct or plagiarism. Um, and I think Sarah mentioned it earlier as well, we've been very fortunate not to have uh, many cases at all, only minor incidences, but we've dealt with them quickly and uh, make sure that there's an appropriate level of consequence and we always involve the parents as well so that uh, they, they fully they, they participate in that process. Um, but as a minimum, we all our sessions are recorded so that uh, if there's any need to go back and, and review anything, then, then it's all there. Uh, and all the technology under Valencia's auspices are, are monitored and recorded for safeguarding reasons. Uh, Zoom bombing, yes, that's always, uh, people are conscious of that and what can happen there, but um, we've ensured that all the Zoom logins are via the students' authenticated Valencia campus Zoom accounts. So that uh, helps enormously as, there as well. Uh, we've also been very clear uh, on boundaries with, with teachers and ensuring that they don't join any social media groups or WhatsApp groups that, uh, that they shouldn't be, and uh, also inform parents of their responsibilities outside Valencia. Um, of course, putting all these measures in place, it doesn't mean to say it's going to stop misconduct entirely. It, it does happen, but that, uh, so we just make sure that our governance aspects uh, of our school are upheld and that the students understand the values and also that they feel that they can report any inappropriate or concerning behaviors as, as they happen. And they can do that by their designate, designated mentors. Uh, we haven't mentioned mentors yet, but we have a mentor a structure student success uh, division and um, the mentors build up a very good and close relationship with them. Ross, Ross you're on you. mute. <laughs> How foolish of me. Um, thank you, Rick. Um, Rob, I'm going to ask you to come back in. I want to kind of stick with online safety. I know it's going to be a big, probably the greatest concern for teachers in the UK. Um, another concern, you know, we mentioned both the context of online learning and traditional schooling, you know, cyberbullying. Have you any specific advice um, for, on how teachers can prevent that from occurring during online school? Well, I mean, I think certainly bullying and cyberbullying is a significant problem that we always have to be aware of. I would argue that bullying is something that happens in the dark. And so what you need to do is to make sure that the sun is shining brightly in your class so that there's a culture of transparency where you see what's happening with your students, you're able to observe what's going on, and using the context of office hours, et cetera, you have an opportunity to always check in with your students and have a, uh, an atmosphere of openness with your students so that if problems are arising, you're able to actually see them as they're happening. As, uh, as Rick mentioned, with um, Valencia, we have mentors, right, that have a particular relationship with students and are there to coach them, if you will, in terms of their learning. So they're also there to catch, if you will, those moments where you can see that something's going on with a student that's not quite right. Um, one thing that I've done with my own classes online is that, you know, we've just talked about how students don't want to come to office hours. If they're having a problem with bullying, they really don't want to come to office hours and talk about that. So one thing that I've used because I'm able to do this is that I always show up in the live Zoom class um, 30 minutes to 15 minutes early. And I always make it clear at the very end that if folks wanna hang out and chat with me about something, and once again, I use a cliffhanger, there's something going on with the pandemic, do you wanna hear more about it? You're free to stay. Having those two sort of pre and post kinds of opportunities for students to hang with you is actually a way in which you can read the temperature of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And if something problematic is going on, it often emerges in those sort of unstructured moments with your so for, so for people watching, you know, teachers that are maybe considering wanting to work with you, for example, um, I, I'm assuming you give all the training and, you know, the cyberbullying, you know, we're now in a place where maybe cyberbullying outweighs physical bullying uh, with the wealth of the internet. Do you provide uh, the, the necessary training for people that sign up to work with you? Oh, certainly. Yes, yes. I mean, we're, and also don't forget with Valencia, there's a sort of a team based sort of, it takes a village approach to working with our students. So there's the teachers, there are also the coaches mm -hmm. slash mentors. And so it's the combination of that sort of team based approach that allows us to make sure that students are not just learning, but that they're learning safely. But yes, there's significant training that goes into um, how, how our teachers are prepared. 
Okay, thank you. I'm going to uh, thank you, Rob. I'm going to bring in Amy. Um, I know that a lot of schools have found it quite difficult to monitor and assess students studying at home. And I know particularly when the pandemic started, uh, the increase of notifications and, and emails went through, uh, <laughs> flooded many people's inboxes. Um, so, you know, we won't be sending parents end of year reports everywhere. Some schools are. But what, what ways do you use to monitor and assess students' progress, both for your understanding as a virtual school and to have that data that you can share with students and their parents? Absolutely. And I think reporting is one of the key items that people wonder about as it relates to, to online learning. So the key internal metrics that we constantly monitor are live session attendance. So attendance is something that, we, that we're constantly looking at. Uh, fortunately, we have mentors. You can follow up with students on the day if they're not in their live session. So just as, as, uh, as you would see in the brick and mortar school, if a student doesn't show up at, at school, uh, their, their parents would get a phone call in the same way. If a student doesn't uh, show up at a live session, it's treated in the same way. So live session attendance is a big one and, and students actually have uh, a duly performed requirement attached to it. So they know it's part of the, their, um, their reporting requirements for the end of term and the end of semester. Um, we also monitor submission rates on a weekly basis. So we just follow up with all students over the course. Uh, we've, so we've actually basically catered for a learning curve. And I think that's important to note is what we've seen with students who are transitioning into an online uh, mode of, of learning, they take a while to get used to learning in that in that mode and so uh, submission rates weren't particularly high when uh, they aren't particularly high when they first start and um, so we give them a little bit of grace in the beginning and we sort of give them a few warnings um, but what we what we do is we basically follow up with students over the course of the first sem semester when they don't submit we give them extensions on work and we are very clear then that this is a process whereby the warnings sort of wane off and they start to they start to we start, to, we start to have stricter enforcement of our policy. So submission rates are, are key. Those are kind of the two behavioral indicators that we're monitoring on a daily and weekly basis. Um, naturally, we're looking at academic progress, term to term. So we're looking at things like um, the GPA against, uh, we've used uh, the CAT4 assessments, which are incredibly helpful in just understanding um, you know, th their cognitive abilities, uh, whether they are making progress to the level that we anticipate um, and what's great is we establish we've established meeting rhythms between our faculty and our student success teams so that we're not just looking at individual uh, and at an individual siloed approach of a risk on a specific subject we're also looking um, across at all of this at all of the student subjects and understanding how they're doing at a macro view and then this report that you can see on screen is it's it's a basic report that we send out to parents um, it's a progress report that they receive on a Friday. So our, um, all of our courses, uh, they have a modular approach. So modules released on a weekly, on weekly increments. Um, and at the, end of the, at the end of the week, they have weekly deadlines. And so on a Friday, parents get a report, their kids are copied into it, where they can basically see for each subject, how many live sessions did they attend? Um, how many live sessions were they excused from? And that would have been obviously in, in um, collaboration with the parent, um, assignments submitted, and then the cumulative time that they've spent online. And these, what we hope this will do on a Friday, because the submission deadlines are on a Monday, we hope that it will allow parents to have meaningful conversations with, with their child um, before the deadline arrives, so that if there is an opportunity for them to remediate before the deadline, they can intervene at the appropriate Amy, can time. Can you give um, a general rule of thumb of, of class sizes just for people's um, interest? Yes, absolutely. So the majority of our class sizes at the moment are between 25 and 30 students in a class. We find that quite manageable because um, we can really then effectively utilize breakout sessions um, and we can really foster a sense of community. I think it's, a, it's an interesting balance um, and we've, we've seen that between 25 to 30 students at this at the stage is, is really working well. Great, thank you. Um, Rob, I'm going to ask, um, you know, life outside of school, do you have any advice um, on how teachers can encourage, um, you know, that fine balance between academic work, um, you know, maintaining social relationships with friends online during lockdown? Right, so <clears throat> once again, I think 
one important way of thinking about this is to not think that the student that you might have seen in your brick and mortar classroom, that that is actually where they live and that's only where they exist. So I think as Sarah pointed out, mm -hmm. having a real interest in and connecting with students' lives outside of the classroom, I think in the online space is particularly important because I think it gives you an opportunity to understand your students. That's data, that's intel that you can use to really understand when problems are arising, what might be a factor in those problems, but it also allows you to try to connect what they're learning in your class or at school with things that they really care about. So at the start of this, I talked about the importance of agency and really one key part of agency is helping students figure out what do I care about? What am I excited to do? And that excitement, that caring, that passion comes from something in their lives. So we quite often talk about, you know, work-life balance, school-life balance, when there's a colleague of mine at the Harvard Graduate School of Education that says this balance thing implies that they're against each other. But in fact, what, we'd be, what would, we should be thinking about is a productive integration of school and life. So school and life goes together. School informs your life and allows you to make it and take it in a direction that, that you want as a student. And your life actually gives you a foundation to make school focused and more interesting for you. So I think bringing those two together will be very helpful in this regard. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I'm getting lost. Yeah, uh, just to remind the audience, you know, Rob here is a world leading expert in uh, online learning. Um, so thank you, Rob. Um, thinking about the next school year, so uh, from September, uh, this week our schools in Scotland um, are closing down for the summer. Uh, there'll be hundreds of thousands of 11 year olds um, transitioning into secondary school. And, uh, you know, that's a big challenge for most of us at, at normal times. But if we still find ourselves having to teach as we are now, and, you know, the head teachers, at least that I'm in touch with, that suggest that despite government advice, that's going to be the case. Um, what advice do you have on getting the best out of our children? Well, right now, I think, um, because I'm, I'm facing the same thing this fall as well, with a new batch of students, try to set up um, sort of a, an intro and a check-in with each of them. Once again, try to find out what their situation is, try to find out what they're bringing to the table, what their concerns are. It will help you understand how you might be able to create a class that will work for them, but it will also signal to them strongly that you really care about them and you care about their learning. So if you're not able to meet with your students um, face to face and see them in the classroom together, I think the only thing we can do is to have live outreach if we can to each of them. I mean, I'm facing a class of 65 students um, um, this fall, and I think it's gonna take quite a bit of time, but you do a rolling process of even as short as 15 minutes with each student. I think that's gonna be incredibly helpful. And I've tried it this summer, right? I have 60 students this summer, and in one week, I've met all of them. So you're and already starting that now? Just like you would in a normal school and transition, you need to make connections now before the year. That Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Um, Rick, uh, uh, kind of couple, uh, a couple, a final question. Um, when you've been recruiting teachers, um, do you think there are any special skills that teachers need to work effectively on, in an online environment? And what advice and training do you provide those teachers uh, who are watching? Um, Ross, yeah. I not uh, too different from someone recruiting for a brick and mortar school really but you know passion for educating young people is obviously critical um having a progressive outlook creativity certainly uh, it's about taking what a good teacher would do in a classroom and translating that into uh, an online presentation uh, a good dose of confidence as well not to be afraid afraid of uh, the the camera in front of you mm -hmm. um and to inject, I think Sarah mentioned this as well, a lot of your own personality into your teaching um, and uh, being exuberant, drawing students in and creating that sense of community, which we've alluded to as well. Uh, you know, we've, we've also said building trust online is, is a little bit more challenging, uh, but the, one of the best ways to do that is to try and include fun and humor uh, in your lessons if you can do that. But another key ingredient is taking an interest in the lives and happenings of the students. I think Sarah's mentioned it, Rob's just mentioned it now as well. Really important to, to connect with your students on that particular level. So 
taking what a, a good teacher would do in a brick and mortar school and being able to adapt that into the online environment is what uh, we'd look for. Um, we do provide training. We've spoken about training a little bit before, but certainly training on our systems and our approach. Um, and in learning how to use a technology opens up ideas and allows for that creativity to flow. Mm -hmm. um, at Valencia, one of our key successes is also collaboration. It's been mentioned before, I think, by Amy that uh, we do have different divisions within Valencia. And uh, what we've basically taken is, is a teacher's role and put them into specialist teams. So we deal with all the key elements within the school, but within those specialist teams. So there's, there's teaching, there's curriculum design, there's mentoring and coaching, there's technology and so on. So we work closely together um, and that can sometimes be challenging, but the collective thinking produces some very innovative uh, and new ways of doing things. And, and we all know that you know, what sort of synergy is developed through co collaboration. Um, and for us, this delineation of teachers' roles helps the teacher themselves to focus on what they do best, and that's to interact and to teach. Uh, another question, Rick, in terms of equipment that a teacher might need at home, you know, I've got my kind of podcast microphone here, a whiteboard, you know, a little uh, a camera of this side. And obviously I do a lot of those things as a blogger, but apart from a laptop, is there anything specific that a teacher may need if they work with you or, or that Valencia provides? Ross, is that a question for me? I lost your, yeah, your was, audio was, there for a yeah. moment there. Well, Sorry, do you mind repeating? It's to, it's to Rob or, or Rick, I suppose. You know, in, in terms of the equipment I need as a teacher to work for Valencia, is it simply a laptop or, you know, do I need my whiteboard? Uh, do I need a camera, you know, specific types of resources such as cameras, microphones, or is it pretty straightforward stuff? I don't know. If you can answer that, that would be great. Yeah, no, I can, I can go. I was just waiting to see if Rob was going to, to answer that one. Uh, a laptop is, is great. I mean, that's what uh, most of our teachers will use. Uh, one thing that's fairly indispensable to delivering lessons is uh, a second screen so that you can spread your various bits of work out. So, so that we find incredibly useful as well. And there are other things that you can get and develop and, and help to enhance what you're doing. Uh, you can include... Um, specific special interactive whiteboards if you want to. Um, there, there are other things you can do, but you know, effective teaching, I think Sarah mentioned it earlier, is about building that relationship with your student. Mm -hmm. And you don't need a lot of technology to do that. It's about you interacting with, with the oh, student. Yeah. And, and in fact, one other thing I would add is that it really depends on what style you're most comfortable with and what really reflects your personality as a teacher, but sort of a not overly expensive investment that I think many folks have made is buying one of those holders that have a very flexible neck for your smartphone camera. I mean, your smartphone camera is like one of the best video cameras that you probably have in the house. Mm -hmm. And that will allow you to capture, for example, if you point it downward, you can, instead of using a whiteboard, you can use a piece of paper write things out and in zoom you can have a direct link with your phone that allows you to share that with your students so it's kind of the equivalent of a board mm -hmm. and that works very well for me as a science teacher it's very important to be able to diagram things out and so i use my camera Thank my phone you, <laughs> um amy a final question and so for um no, I guess I'm covering all areas, you know, but specifically for teachers who find themselves maybe looking for new, uh, new work or for those going into school before a vaccine is found. Are you looking for new teachers next year? What options are available for the 2% of parents that are watching, the school leaders out there that are looking, you know, uh, I haven't observed all the chat box, you know, but the costs, those types of things. Um, what, what can you uh, offer just to finish? So perhaps I'll hand over to Nesh just to speak about our intakes and um, some of our fee structures and things like that for the parent side of things. But I'm so glad you asked me about uh, teachers because we're always looking for fantastic teachers. And we do have um, an intake coming up in September and one in January um, and then another in June and September next year as well. Um, as you know, we're planning to expand our offering to A-levels as well. So we're always looking for, for really good teachers um, who are interested in trying um, something new and innovative and different. 
um, and who have uh, extensive experience working with international curriculum specifically. So if you are interested in applying for any of the positions at Valencia now in the future, uh, you're welcome to email your resume to uh, facultyrecruitment at valenciainstitute.com. Thank you, Inesh. Inesh, Inesh do, you want to, do you want to take the question on, yeah, on our intake? Great. Um, yeah, so, so we're currently recruiting for a few intakes. We've got the June-July intake, which is closing next week. Um, so, you know, if you do have any students that are interested in online learning and need some more information before that, it would be useful to send them our way as quickly as possible just to get them informed. We also have a September intake. The June-July intake is predominantly for our junior high. Um, the September intake will be for our junior high level as well as our international GCSE. And then we've got our big January 2021 intake. Uh, so there's multiple intakes on the go. When it comes to, to fee structures, I think the best thing to do is uh, we have this wonderful uh, email address, which is admissions at uh, valentiainstitute.com. That's admissions at valentiainstitute.com. And we'll be able to send you a detailed structure of all the different options available for the fees. Um, yeah, I guess just, I mean, for me, I use every platform um, that I can just to echo the voice of the parents and the students. We tend to speak to quite a few of them on a daily basis. And I think just a lasting thought for myself would be, you know, patience is, is key. We've been astounded by the feedback we've got from parents about how they've responded to online learning um, during the COVID pandemic and, and just giving students an extra bit of time just to acclimatize to, to what online learning is. They've seen them excel. And, and I think uh, for us not to be too afraid about the potential of online or only seeing it as a short-term solution. Uh, we've had a massive spike in admissions and interest from, from everybody around the world, predominantly the UK as well. Uh, so if you do have any you know, people or students that you do interact with on a daily basis that need some more information, please feel free to send them our way. Great. Um, so with three minutes uh, to spare, I think we've done very well for time, everyone. Um, so for everyone watching, you, uh, we'll export all the chat box and answer your questions and things. But I um, just want to say thank you to Dr. Robert Liu, to Amy, to Nesh, to Rick and Sarah uh, for your time and wisdom uh, and to offer um, the global community um, another option. Uh, I, I, you know, what is the future of school? You know, bricks and mortar, those types of things forever, never mind uh, a pandemic. Um, but thank you for watching. Thank you um, for everyone taking part. Uh, we'll get the slides and the video to you shortly. Um, I, I wish you all the best. Um, my name is Ross McGill. I've been your host at Teacher Toolkit. Um, bye for now and thank you once again. Thank you, everyone. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Thanks bye, so everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.